Our second scripture lesson this morning is from the Ten Commandments. I invite you to uh, turn to Exodus chapter 20, and I'll be reading from verse... Some of you may not have to turn to this. You may know it by heart. Uh, how many of you had to memorize the Ten Commandments when you were coming up so you know this? Perhaps in the King James Version, maybe be good for you to read it in and up for it. Um, so if you'd like to follow along in whatever version, um, please do. Exodus chapter 20, verses 1 through 17. Then God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in the heaven above, or that is on the earth beneath, or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them, for the Lord your God am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of the parents to the third and the fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who keep uh, who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your son, your daughter, your male, female slave, your livestock, or even the alien resident in your towns. For in, the six, for in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, but the seventh, but rested on the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and consecrated it. Honor your father and mother, so that your days may be long given to you. You shall not murder, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor, you shall not, you shall not covet your neighbor's wife, or male, or female, or anything that belongs to <laughs> The first of those ten, of any other gods before me, is the essence, the foundation, the bedrock, the sumum bonum, of the Abrahamic faiths. If you want to know what the faith is about, go right there. You shall have no other gods before me. It is the first pillar of Islam. There is no God but Allah. Um, it is part of the great commandment. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. It is in the mezuzah that is on every Orthodox Jewish door that is rubbed, and the words are remembered, Hear, O Israel, the Shema of Israel, the Lord your God is one. It is the summum bonum, the essence. By the way, that means the highest good. It is um, the bedrock, the foundation. And yet, to be sure, many of us who encounter those words might think, this is an abstraction. What does it have to do with daily life? And if that is your impression, I don't want you to stand on it because it has everything to do with your everyday life. And it has everything to do with Islam. Sad, angry person that, who, who, whose rage pierces his heart, but Allah will be stopped in his tracks and will distance himself from those violent emotions. Even though Buddhism does not have essence, mindfulness of all creation and compassionate concern connectedness which distances ourselves from violent emotions from all that disturbs that interconnected oneness and the compassion therein and in a similar vein uh, theologian John Burgess tells a story about uh, having to give a lecture on the Ten Commandments just the weekend after 9-11 that tragic event that so changed the course of American history. 
I'm the pastor of the church in Connecticut, and he talked about perhaps canceling the lecture, thinking nobody wants to hear a lecture on the Ten Commandments after this tragic event in the midst of so much grief and pain. What difference could the Ten Commandments make? Well, they decided to go ahead with it, and to their surprise, a bumper crop of people showed up, and they showed up not out of politeness, but because of the subject, because of the grief and the chaos that had been created in their lives, they were asking the question, what can I trust? In whom do I trust? Theologian Susan Thistlethwaite says it's the basic question of life. What do I trust? And in whom do I trust? That's the essence of what the first commandment is about. It's about trusting the one who created heaven and earth. It's the essence of it. And it's important to remember that the first commandment was also given in a time of deep turmoil. The prelude to the first commandment says it all. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. It is the story of Exodus that is the prelude and the supposition behind the first commandment. It's almost as if God brought them out of slavery to make a point. I am the one you can trust. I am the sumum bonum. I am the one who girds your life, who liberates you, who redeems you. I am the essence of all. Trust me. The very revelation of the, of the divine name in Exodus gets at this. You may remember the story of the burning bush where uh, Moses was called to go preach to Pharaoh, let my people go. And, of course, um, Moses was re reticent to do this. And so ask of God, so what is your name? Whom shall I say that sent me? And God replied out of the burning bush, I am who I am. Tell them I am sent you. Not the most concrete name for God, is it? <laughs> I mean, how would you react? I don't know about you, but I want something I can wrap my hands around, like God the Good Shepherd, right? Or God the Rock, God the Savior, God the Fire, God the Wind, something that has some punch to it. But then a moment's thought, especially for those of us who are part-time mystics, and I hope all of us are at least part-time mystics, is that the revelation of the divine name in the verb to be is the deepest, most profound mystery of all of the Christian and Islamic and Jewish faith. It gets to the heart of it all. It tries to say something to us that we all ought to know about that which is really real. That the baseline of all things, God, the becoming in our becoming is God. That without this God who is, we could not be sustained in life. Without this God who is, we could not be liberated, redeemed. Without the God who is, we would not be sustained in our very being for that coming becoming. So I want to suggest to you this morning that the first commandment and the very revelation of the divine name of God as the one who is, is the greatest mystery and essence of our faith. I am struck by the fact that um, when God called Moses to come up to the mountain, God said, come up to the mountain and be present. Come up to the mountain and be present. God was calling Moses to come up to the mountain to receive the Torah, the Ten Commandments. But why do you think God added, and be present? The rabbis have pondered this for centuries. And the Talmud talks about it. There's a lot of postulation about uh, speculation about uh, what it means to be present. Why did God say be present? Why wasn't just come up the mountain enough? Well, it's altogether clear when you think about it. I mean, you know, have you ever been somewhere but not there? <laughs> have you? Yeah. I mean, when I go up to a mountaintop, I can be present to the mountain, but I'm also thinking, how am I going to get down? <laughs> 
And you've got to believe that Moses was up there and he had a long laundry list of things that he wanted to tell the Israelites. Now, what am I going to tell them? This is a cantankerous people. But God said to Moses, be present, to be, to be aware of what's going on about you, to be aware of the awesomeness. Kingdom is standing before you, God, in every moment, present. It could not be sustained. And of course, there's a Hebrew verb that is not well translated in, uh, I know your suffering. It act that we know in Christ. Deep pathos. And it is the God of deep pathos, according to, um, to Elizabeth. Because God was there before. We're even speculating about God. God is in that place. So, if you're thinking that the first commandment, uh, you shall have no other, no other gods before me, is uh, simply a mathematical puzzle or simply about one rather, two, rather than two or three or four or something like that, I hope you can understand it goes much deeper. Oh, so much deeper. It goes into the very essence of who God is and who we are before God. It goes into the very depth of God's creation. And in spite of the fact that we encounter so many different things that seek to counter God's life-giving power in the world, so many things like death and disease and um, an economic system that creates gross daps, gaps between the rich and the poor, we experience homophobia, ethnocentricity, we experience racism of varied sorts, we experience things in the world that are powers that feel like gods against us. The reality of the divine name and the reality of the great commandment comes to us and says something to us that gives us hope and the power to resist. It says that God is the being in our being, the becoming in our becoming, without which we could not be sustained, without which we would not find liberation and life and hope. God is the one in whom we belong in life and in death and in everything in between. And that for us, folks, is good news. It gives us the essence of what our faith is about, the essence of living. That a God that sustains us, in whom we live and move and be, will not let us go. Amen.